Thank you very much, Jenny, and it's really a great pleasure to be here and um, to join in this conference. And I'm also a bit of a fleeting guest, but um, I do hope that if you have any questions that you don't manage to, to um, have addressed this afternoon, then please do get in contact with me. And I always very much enjoy hearing Chris talk, and then, of course, it's now my responsibility to bring you completely back down to earth and um, talk about some terrestrial ecology for a while. So I'm Helen Roy. I'm based um, in the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, which is a NERC-funded research institute. And within the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, I lead the zoology side of things within a group called the Biological Record Centre. And I'll explain a little bit more about the Biological Record Centre as I go through and how we work towards openness and rigour with our very large-scale, long-term data sets that we hold that are um, collated by volunteers. So I, I've got a lot of slides, but I'm hopefully just going to give you lots of sound bites and hopefully some, some good pictures too and um, some observations. But I just wanted to begin by defining citizen science and, and what I'm meaning by citizen science. And I'm very much biodiversity um, focused and looking at volunteer collection of biodiversity and environmental data, which contributes to expanding our knowledge of the natural environment. And this is including the biological recording that I've already mentioned to you and um, interpretation of environmental observations. It's a very dense slide, and I'm not going to go through all of it in detail. If you're interested in different approaches to system science, there's a good paper out um, by Bonnie in 2009 where she went through the different types of projects, and we're going to, we've already heard about the, the range of projects um, and the range of approaches that people can take with system science, and she just explains this in a little bit more detail. We, we would add another, she, she um, recognized three types and three approaches. We would add the um, volunteers working together on all of the stages of the project without the involvement necessarily of professional science. Scientists. And um, this is a model that's characteristic very much of local biodiversity atlas projects, which have been going on for centuries and centuries um, within the United Kingdom. So one of the things I just wanted to mention to you first was that at the end of last year, um, I published a review that was commissioned by the UK Environmental Observation Framework, where I worked with a partner at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and also partners at the Natural History Museum. And we reviewed hundreds and hundreds of different um, system science projects, including some of the ones that Chris has already mentioned today. And we went, took out lots of different attributes from these different projects and then ran them through a multifactorial analysis, looking at aspects such as um, what type of project they were, what sort of field of research were they in, and um, various other aspects of that project. Did they involve school children, etc.? Is there evidence of data quality, things like this? And um, we were really excited. We expected that we were going to see these great clustering of different project types that we would sort of have our own sort of universe feel to. And um, this is very much what we got. This is actually maybe it is like a spiral universe or something. I don't know. Maybe that's what we got and we've missed it. <laughs> yeah, quite. So if anyone wants to make something from that, then um, absolutely wonderful. So it's the landscape of system science. And at first we sort of felt this sense of, oh, and then we thought, well, quite, that's exactly what system science is like. It's hugely diverse and there's projects in all different directions of being taken in by different people doing different things. And actually, that's a celebration of system science, that huge diversity and that huge range of approaches. But of course, that wasn't going to be enough to report back to the people who commissioned this project. And so we need to look a little bit more detail um, at this um, picture. And so we tried to kind of look at these different axes and how they were best explained. And um, the way in which they seem to be best explained is looking at the, the amount of investment that needs to go into a project and the scientific sampling and whether it's mass participation and what kind of data is being collected. Is it very straightforward observations or is it requiring somebody taking many, many more measurements, both um, climatic variables, for instance, alongside some biological um, observations? Um, and if you're interested in that, then there is the full report is available. And um, we, from this, produced a sort of glossy guide to system science. And I've left some of the copies of that um, down on the reception desk. And if, 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 if you want any more information, then please do get in, in contact with me. But 
I'm going to focus very much on the biological recording within this landscape assistance science and um, what we're doing with respect to um, rigor and openness. So I appreciate that we have a very diverse um, audience and um, I hope there are some zoologists, biologists in the audience as well. This is my first time, I think, ever in a physics building. So um, I'm feeling um, yeah, quite excited to be, um, to be here. Um, so what is biological recording and who are our citizen scientists? Well, biological recording has a hugely long history. Back in the 1600s, a gentleman called John Ray was mapping all of the plants in Cambridgeshire. And um, very recently, uh, there's been a translation of his Latin text. And it's just absolutely fantastic, the work that he was doing as a citizen scientist all those hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And in many ways, biological recording hasn't changed at all. I grew up on the Isle of Wight as a biological recorder, and I definitely think there were reminiscent times of the John Ray times back in the 1600s, I'm sure. And our biological recorders um, haven't changed hugely either. There are people who are going out, making observations. They're interested um, people. And they might be, for example, these people here, uh, just out in a group, just observing some um, some species or other, which hopefully they'll make into a biological record by saying where they found it, when they found it, what it was, and, and who they were. But more recently as well, there's been a push for getting school children involved. But when I say this to my botanical colleagues, they say, well, we've already always been pushing to get younger people involved. We're, we're a little bit different, perhaps, sometimes in the zoology world. I don't know. Um, but our citizen scientists can also be school children. They can also be the extreme and passionate experts, such as this is one of my, my friends who goes out recording ladybirds, and this is her looking for quite a rare species of ladybird. So they come in, in many, many um, different guises. And we have about 80 million biological records available and open access for everybody to use. They're shared through the National Biodiversity Network Gateway, and they present um, a fantastic opportunity for people to address some of the really big um, questions, particularly in relation to some of the threats that are posed on um, the environment at the moment, climate change, the arrival of alien species, habitat destruction. We can use these biological um, records to look at species distributions and attribute um, changes over time, particularly in relation to some of these um, big environmental drivers of change. But do these records actually allow us um, to do that? Well, they certainly do provide us with a fantastic opportunity. There's no doubt that in Britain, we're in a hugely fantastic position of having this really rich source of biological data, which is undoubtedly the envy of the world. That we are a peculiar um, nation, I think, in many ways, probably. But in our passion for gathering these biological observations, we're certainly peculiar. And, and there aren't the same data sets across all of the range of taxa. Birds get well covered all the way around the world. But we we have people here rec recording the small soil invertebrates, little columbula, fleas, lots of different groups. So for example, there are about 80 different zoological recording schemes and societies that I represent within the Biological Record Center. So we have these huge opportunities of this fantastic data sets. And this, this map, which you probably can't see too clearly, shows we would never have known that this little orange ladybird, a mildew feeding ladybird, went through, it was a, thought to be a, um, an ancient woodland specialist. And just in the last couple of decades, has gone under a massive range expansion, as is shown by these red dots. We wouldn't have known that if people hadn't been out on the ground um, tracking its um, spread. But there are also lots of challenges with this data. So here we've got the seven spot ladybird, and just in the middle or down to the bottom is the, an, an alien, the harlequin ladybird that I'll talk about a little bit in, in, in a while. And um, this seven spot ladybird, well, we should find it all over the country. It should be everywhere. And you can see there's lots and lots of gaps in that map. So that presents us with a challenge that we have uneven coverage of the recording that's going across on across the country. And also, just looking, I'm going to show you a few graphs, and I won't go into them all to detail, but we can always go back to them, or I can talk through them um, at a later stage over coffee or something. But the recording intensity varies among taxa, so perhaps it's not surprising, although I'm quite envious not being a butterfly um, ecologist myself, I've done a little bit of work with butterflies, but they get a huge amount of attention, lots of people out recording butterflies. So my passion is uh, uh, ladybirds, and I'm uh, the volunteer scheme organiser for the UK Ladybird Survey, so I do that in my own time, and so ladybirds fall within the coleoptera, within the beetles, and um, we're disappointingly um, perhaps lacking enthusiasm within the world of coleoptera as far as recording intensity is concerned. But if we want to do a cross taxa analysis, look at a range of different taxonomic groups, well, we're a little bit stumbling with the, with the difference between um, the recording intensity of those different groups. 
the recording intensity has increased over time, so I won't go through all of these different groups again, but we can see that um, just in the recent decades, there's been a trend of increase in recording intensities for, for many groups. Some groups are going down a little bit. I don't know what's the myriapods of the woodlice and centipedes, and, and they seem to be the purple line, seems to be having a, a bit of time. But we're addressing that. We've got a new website. You can go and have a look at the millipede and um, woodlice um, website and find out more. We have a similar um, profile of our recording pattern that um, Chris showed you with his beautiful diagram with lots of coloured um, squares. Well, our diagram is less um, exciting, but essentially most records come from a very few recorders. We can see that as a challenge, but we can also see that as hugely beneficial because if we get those recorders recording even more, those few recorders, well, we'll get even more. So, you know, we can look at the different um, parts of that graph and um, look for the, the ways to, to make the most of that um, Another problem we have, so if you imagine that for all of these groups, for the ladybirds, for example, there's 47 species of ladybirds within Britain. It's very rare that somebody goes out with the intention of recording all 47 of those ladybirds. Well, they wouldn't find them all in one site anyway. But if we knew that they were actually looking for all 47, then that would give us a fantastic extra bit of information for our um, database. But we don't know that. Most people are just going, going to go and make one quick observation of a seven-spot ladybird, and that's it. We'll never know whether they were looking for the others or not. They probably weren't. We also have problems in spatial patterns of recording behavior. So we can see the hotspots of where people recording grasshoppers and crickets live um, by the map of the records um, that come in. So we can see that um, this biological recorder here, for instance, doesn't record very far away from this little location there. But all of those problems that I've sort of skirted over and we have answers, is what I want to, to say excitingly. So with the new modeling techniques that we can use, with new mixed effect models, um, with a variety of other different approaches, we can use this data. And in terms of the rigor, well, it's fantastically rigorous in terms of the quality of the observation. So our biological recorders in this country, the people who are going out recording bees, for instance, they know their bees. So we know that when they say that it's this particular bee, it is that particular bee. It's the other problems that we have to overcome. And so we've been doing um, some work, and particularly a colleague of mine, Nick Isaac, to look at how we can use different analyses techniques to detect um, change within these data sets, despite the fact that they have lots of confounding problems within them with respect to spatial spread, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'm not going to go through all of this in, in any detail. It's just to really say that we do have techniques for using that data, and mixed effect models um, are a very, very good way um, to go. And if anybody wants any more information on these, I'm, I'm very happy to, to provide it. Another way in which we're ensuring quality and ensuring the flow of records and making things a lot easier for people to get involved is by having software that makes recording very, very easy. But we do have this diverse audience. We have, I remember when we, we published the Flea Atlas, and I went down to see 80-year-old Bob George, who was the Flea Recording Scheme organizer, and I, I knew he didn't have a computer, so I took down the data to show him how it's on the National Biodiversity Network Gateway, and it was open for everyone to see his flea data now. And I was so ex excited, and I went down to his house, and he said, I said, I've got your data here on the computer to show you. And he said, well, well, you can if you want, but I'll just make us a cup of tea. And he wasn't interested at all in the fact that the whole world was sharing his data. He was happy that they were, but he didn't really want to see it. It meant nothing to him. He just wanted to look at the fleas. But for some people, they do want to look at their data, and iRecord gives them that opportunity to do that and helps us with data flow. And we have expert verifiers behind the system checking out photos and checking out out of um, area records, and we have various automated rule sets within there as well. We also provide a rich reporting mechanism so that people can um, get their data back very easily and see how it maps against other people's systems. So I would say that we, we are in a very, very good position in the biological recording world. We can describe change, we can attribute change, and we can use that change for a variety of different end uses, whether it be for policymakers to look at biodiversity indicators, for instance, which are all very important as we move towards biodiversity 2020 and the um, various targets that we're trying to meet with respect to biodiversity. I just very, very quickly just going to focus on the ladybird survey, and it will be very quick, because I, as soon as I get talking about ladybirds, it could be very long, but I will be disciplined. And um, the UK ladybird survey fits in, in, in this top position within that big landscape that I showed you. We have quite high investment in terms of resources that we provide and things, but it is a mass participation project. We have a, a, a website that we hope is good and, and rich in information. 
we link with this iRecord system and we have an iRecord survey form, but I also want to gather data. I'm interested in evolutionary ecology as well, so I want to gather data on color forms of ladybirds as well, so we add that um, to our recording form. And we get fascinating records sent to us, like this little ladybird here, Stathorus punctillum. If you were to draw a dot on the paper in front of you, that's about the size of Stathorus punctillum. I get excited just talking about it. And um, so somebody who found this, it's just absolutely remarkable that somebody actually does manage to find this. And this comes through on our survey website. And that just, well, I think, fantastic. And... Um, we are also, we've, we've worked a lot with the media, we've worked a lot with the BBC, and we have lots of resources available for children as a consequence um, of that. I'm on Twitter with the ladybirds. The ladybirds are the charismatic partner in this. I just about only tweet about ladybirds, but somehow 1,500 people are pleased to hear about ladybirds, or maybe they've strayed onto it by accident, but um, they do seem to, to stay. And we get fantastic records through Twitter, and this is one that um, came through um, last summer. We've just about next week, we'll be launching a smartphone app, and I can show you the prototype. I'm very excited about that. That's all looking fantastic. But one of the things that I'd like to say with respect to the rigor and the openness is that we can have all the technology in the world, and we can engage this, our crowd um, using the technology, but we still need that face-to-face -face contact. You still need that passion, that enthusiasm, and going out and talking to people and engaging the community. And um, that's certainly been an extremely important part of getting the contributions to the Ladybird survey and engaging the media. We're really excited when Ladybirds took over the front page of the Times. And this data is valuable and it is useful. I had a review back from a, uh, on one of my peer-reviewed publications last week where this one reviewer said, excellent, lovely manuscript, it was great. Another one said, how can we trust this data? Not even reading any further. And it's just so frustratingly narrow-minded, I will say it, um, to, to not consider all the things that are going on in terms of ensuring the rigor and um, ensuring that the data is fit for purpose. And um, this is just one example whereby we've used this ladybird data that's been coming in, and I mentioned this alien harlequin ladybird. It's arrived in 2004. It's a voracious predator. It threatens the other ladybirds. We were able to use all of these tens and tens of thousands. We had 40,000 records of the harlequin ladybird, since, uh, which I know doesn't compare to the kind of uses that Chris talks about, but in, in the ladybird world, that's big numbers, and um, recording harlequin ladybirds, and also recording the native ladybirds. So we were able to show, for instance, very depressingly, that this is a little two-spot ladybird, a common and widespread species. And we were able to use Belgian data and British data. We just look at the British data, the dashed line shows the decline um, after the arrival of the harlequin ladybird. And we were able to use these modeling techniques that um, I mentioned to you to use this data for um, some good... Um, robust science and um, publish that at the end of the year and I find it fantastically satisfying that that's based on volunteer data. We're using that system, we've produced an alert system for non-native species now for, um, for DEFRA um, using the same sort of approach to getting people involved in recording species and we're looking out for the Asian hornet and the fearful, um, the, um, it's not fearful, the fierce killer shrimp which is pictured here. So biological recording for the 21st century, we have the tools to model diversity change using these unstructured biological records. We've got to keep getting the records coming in, we've got to keep motivating people to supply their data and supply their records, just as they have been doing for centuries and centuries. And there's ways in which we can definitely be smarter about that data collection. And we're only just beginning to exploit this huge resource of 80 million records that are open to all of you um, to get involved with and use. And I can assure you they are rigorous. Um, and we can use them in so many different ways to answer so many of the very important questions um, that we have within um, the um, biodiversity world today. So that's it from me. Thank you very much.